dear colleagues, I would like to first thank the organization committee for this beautiful presentations. And I would like to also thank the International Young Academy of Cardiology. Um, today, it's a pleasure for me to present my presentation in Cardiology Education Channel. And I will be talking about aortic valve stenosis. Uh, I'm working in Halic University and also in Stian University as a physician, cardiology physician. Uh, and my faculties are in Istanbul, Turkey. That's a pleasure for me to participate in these presentations. So aortic valve stenosis is the most common cause of left ventricular outflow of surgery. Etiology depends on the uh, congenital diseases. Developed, in developed countries, it's degenerative mostly, but in the underdeveloped countries, it's rheumatic disease. Most commonly, we see degenerative, rheumatic, and congenital aortic valves in the aortic stenosis, but uncommonly, subvalvular mem membranes, provalvular membranes, or drugs and radiation might cause also aortic valve stenosis, and rarely we see other congenital malformations together with other kinds of diseases like Paget disease. As a congenital aortic valve stenosis, the most common type is the bicuspid aortic valve disease. It is uh, in the large study population is like uh, five to eight uh, per five to eight patients in 10,000 uh, patients. And the, the pathology is uh, mainly seen in 10% of the first degree relatives. Male to female ratio, ratio is like two to one. In males, it's a more common scene. And the valve might be anatomically or functionally bicuspid. If it is anatomically, anatomically bicuspid, it's truly only two cusps. But if it's functionally bicuspid, there is an incomplete separation of the one cusp, and that is causing the morphology of the valve. Most common failure of the separation is right, cu uh, right cusp and left cusp. And as this is associated also with the aortic root dilation. But if there is separation problem in the right coronary cusp and non-coronary cuspus, there is associated mitral valve prolapses in this type of separation malformations. As you can see on the right side of the slide, there is type one, type two, and type three. And the most common is the type one, as it is seen in this figure. Because with aortic valve disease is most common congenital disease and in uh, less than 65 years old, the most common etiology is the because with aortic valve disease for aortic valves. Isolated aortic stenosis seen is 85% uh, of all cases and aortic regurgitation might be uh, concomitant to isolate, uh, concomitant to aortic stenosis. And this is also related to junction dilatation in the aorta. So uh, aortic regurgitation is more prone to occur in the younger population and the aortic stenosis mostly occurs in, uh, in the older population. When we say older, it's still under 65 years. Other complications related to because of the aortic valve disease is infective endocarditis, aortic complications such as dilatation, dissection, or rupture of the aorta. And there might be also, we should always keep in mind that concomitant congenital diseases might be together with because of the aortic valve diseases, and this is most commonly seen as aortic coarctation. In the echocardiography, because of the aortic valve stenosis, uh, mostly uh, diagnosed with transthoracic echocardiography, echocardiography, and parasternal and short and long axis are the most useful ones. And calcifications mostly start to occur in the rough air of because of the aortic valve. And what do, we, what do we see, what do we have to detect or look for is position of the commissures, type of the because of the aortic valve, opening pattern of the commissures, rough air presence, leaflet mobility, aortic root and aortic measurements, and also search for other malformations coexisting with the because of the aortic valves. As you see in here, we have the Parasternal long and short axis of systolic dooming and fish mouth uh, appearance of bicuspid aortic valve in these figures. Another congenital aortic valve stenosis uh, reason is the unicuspid aortic valve. This is more rarely seen and it is like a point uh, nearly like two patients in 100,000 uh, 100, uh, patients. And severe form of aortic valve malformation is seen in, in these patients. There might be two types. One is the echomistral and the other is the unicomistral. What do we say with this? So the, if there is no attachment to aorta of the valve, this is echomistral. But if there is one lateral attachment to the aorta, this is unicomistral and more commonly seen in these patients. Uh, posterior 
Unicomisole opening is the most common, like in this patients we have seen in the right side. In this patient, there is a posterior commissure in the unicuspid aortic valve. This patient also had the uh, aortic stenosis and LVOT obstruction. And the, this patient also have to be operated. And these are the echocardiographic evaluations before the operation. Another congenital aortic valve stenosis is quadricuspital aortic valve disease. This is more or less seen than the unicuspid one. And the important point in these patients are the, the equality of the cusp areas. If there is equal areas in the cusps, this means normal, more normal function than the others. However, if there is equality changes between the cusp areas, that might cause early occurrence of complications in the aortic valve or in the aorta. If there is four equal size of cusp, there is mostly normal function of the aortic valve in the beginning of life. But afterwards, we see mostly 75% of aortic regurgitation. And in these patients, the isolated aortic stenosis occurs 1% in every patient. And mostly we see aortic regurgitation. In these patients, if we see an aortic stenosis, at first it starts with the aortic regurgitation mostly, and afterwards it's uh, change to aortic stenosis. And together with that, we see 8% of patients in these patients. Other things that we should be considering is the subaortic or supravalvular uh, obstructing lesions. For example, uh, another point is congenital aortic valve stenosis might be caused by subaortic membranes. As in these patients, the LVOT was obstructed, but the valve is okay. And uh, one to two percent of the patients who have LVOT obstruction have subaortic membranes. Um, these membranes or these lesions might be focal membrane or rich, and less likely there, there, there can be muscular or tunnel type of subaortic membranes. In these patients on the right side, we see subaortic muscular membrane that has that has causing uh, obstruction in the LVOT together with the material regurgitation. Another congenital uh, problem is the supravalvular stenosis. As it is seen in this patient, there is a obstructive membrane in the supravalvular area, which is adjunct to uh, sinotubular junction. And these also might be the reason for the stenosis in the aortic area. Another really common a type of valve stenosis, the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, which is a reason for subvalvular stenosis. Of course, this is another topic, but I would like to show you uh, some images of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we should always consider in our diagnosis and in our um, researches or images while looking for aortic increased, obstruct, increased gradients or obstruction in the aortic area. Most common indication for aortic valve surgery is aortic stenosis, and this is mostly uh, because of degenerative or calcific aortic stenosis. And also, it is the second most common indication for heart surgery. The first one is, the, of course, coronary artery, artery bypass surgery. The ratio between male to female is one in calcific aortic stenosis, and the prevalence has increased with age. At first, like uh, over six to five years old, we see 5%, but the prevalence increased to 10% over 80 years old. The pathology is mostly including inflammation, atherosclerosis, calcification, and lipid depositions, and all of them together causing aortic valve stenosis. Calcification may extend to ventricular septum. In this uh, condition, it might cause with the conduction problems, and it might also uh, extend to the mitral leaflet and causing mitral annular calcification or mitral valve dysfunction. And this is an active process. So it starts, it goes on, and it, instant, it ends with degenerative artery stenosis. And it starts with the, at the cusp attachments. The uh, attachments firstly affected, and uh, it's along with the aortic side to the cusp. In the end, aortic orifice and root was also affected with the calcification. Degenerations might not be just related to aging and, uh, or might, might not be related only to age. Uh, in this patient, for example, we see calcification really 
a huge calcification in the aortic valve. And these severe calcifications might be related to renal disease, for example. In this patient, this patient had kidney disease. Uh, he was under hemodialysis. Sorry, uh, she was under hemodialysis and she was just in, in 45 years old. Because of hemodialysis, calcification occurred earlier and this is a huge calcification seen in the aortic valve closing of obstruction and aortic valve stenosis in this patient. But sometimes the calcification might be related to some other diseases like amyloidosis. Some researchers have resulted that severe degeneration might be related to amyloidosis in nearly 15% in the patients. And this is not the only um, consequence of amyloidosis. Also, there, there, there might be left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, and also aortic stenosis. And always, if we see left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, in future left ventricular hypertrophy and the aortic stenosis, we should always keep in mind that this patient might be amyloidosis. We always see, not always, but mostly see left ventricular hypertrophy with the severe aortic stenosis. But we should not always uh, take, think like, okay, this hypertrophy is because of aortic valve disease. No, we should always keep in mind there might be any other diseases or any kind of deposition diseases that might severely affect the hypertrophia, uh, that may really cause the hypertrophia in the left ventricle. Another cause of stenosis is the rheumatic artery stenosis. In, in the recent years, the prevalence is decreasing. And like 100 years ago, it, it was mostly seen and one of the most common type of artery stenosis. But right now, it is nearly uh, seen mostly in underdeveloped countries and especially in developed countries, the prevalence is decreasing a lot. All they, almost always together with the rheumatic mitral valve disease, uh, Commissural fusion, age of the calf thickening, and also secondary calcium depositions are the uh, pathophysiologic appearance of uh, rheumatic aortic disease. And we should always look at both valves, mitral and aortic valves together when we think about rheumatic aortic valve stenosis or rheumatic aortic valve disease. So what should we do? The imaging is the milestone in this uh, diagnosis. And the milestone is the imaging in this aortic valve diseases. Echocardiographic measurements for better aortic valve evaluation includes aortic root dimensions, LVOT velocity and gradients, aortic valve grad gradients and velocity. Also, which as, as they, they are giving us the aortic valve area and the stroke volume and ejection fraction of the patients. These are the most important part of evaluation and these are the milestones of our imaging for these valves. Echocardiography is not only giving us information about the wall, also it is giving us information about left ventricular function, hypertrophy, left atrial diameters, uh, right ventricular functions, diastolic functions, and pulmonary artery pressure. These are all should be considered together for every patient. One parameter is not always enough. And useful, these parameters are all useful for not just diagnosis, also the prognosis, the treatment strategy, treatment decisions, and predicting the post-procedural or pre-procedural complications for these patients. If there is calcific aortic stenosis, if there is a leaflet separation in the parasternal long axis more than 15 millimeters, we should always consider this is mostly not severe, but maybe moderate to mild aortic stenosis. And at least one is moving properly, that means this is unlikely for severe aortic stenosis. So as at first appearance, we should always keeping these parameters in our minds that we should consider, okay, this is severe or moderate in our mind before doing any more evaluations. But one tool is really useful for all kind of aortic valve disease. This is a continuity equation. We should always first, after our when we are taking our images, we should always consider uh, calculating the aortic valve area. Because after having aortic uh, valve area, and if it is less than one centimeter square, we should afterwards take the evaluations for gradients, ejection fraction, stroke volume, and the diameters in left ventricle and left atrium. But aortic valve area, and afterwards the other parameters will always guide us at first, the aortic stenosis, the uh, severity of aortic stenosis, and afterwards, the type of the aortic stenosis. Why do we consider that? We say just aortic stenosis and with the severe uh, aortic stenosis, because the subtypes are really important while giving our treatment, while diagnosing and 
prognosis of the patients. So as we have seen in here, we first <clears throat> calculate our aortic valve area. If there is low, we mean severe aortic stenosis, stenosis, we look for the ejection fraction. If there is low ejection fraction, we should consider our gradients. And with the low gradients, we should consider low, low, low gradient aortic stenosis. But if it is ejection, if the ejection fraction is more than 50%, but the stroke volume is low, in that condition, we should consider paradoxical aortic stenosis. But if there is normal ejection fraction with normal stroke volume, this is normal flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. But the gradient is okay. That means normal aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis. There are, of course, difficulties during measurements. The low echogenicity, severe calcifications. One of the most important problems is the LVOT measurements, atrial fibrillation, uh, low output, high output states, also multiple valvular diseases are affecting our measurements during echocardiography. For example, in here on the right side, in the figure, we have a continuous wave measurement and gradient measurement of an aortic valve. This is uh, transthoracic echocardiography, not transesophageal. And the transthoracic echocardiography might be useful if we have low echogenicity, if we perform right parastandal aortic measurements, the gradient might be really good and we, we can um, measure the gradient more easily when compared to the left side parastandal long axis or short axis. So when the echogenicity is slow or the patient's hard to obtain aortic gradients, we should always consider right parastandal aortic measurements during our transthoracic echocardiography. Another milestone or another um, controversy is the LVOT measurements. In these patients, for example, as you can see, LVOT might affect our results really, really much. As we have seen, it might be in 1.22 millimeter and another 25. What is the right one? So inner to inner and during mid systole measurements are the most correct one. And underestimations, because it is multiplied by two, leads to small aortic valve areas, low stroke volume, false diagnosis of low, low flow, low gradient, or prognosis or surgical intervention of the patients. So LVOT might be the most important part of our measurement. What is the right one? We should zoom it and we should do the inner to inner measurement and have the exact LVOT measurement. If there is any doubt in our mind, we should recheck that. We should consider T, T together with transthoracic echocardiography and might be also there's another consideration is the alternative techniques like, such as CT or CMR. Another uh, important point is the aortic jet. Mitral and tricuspid with regurgitations are in the same direction of aortic jet and might cause mistakes while our uh, evaluations. So trial the valves are in the same direction, apical, in apical wheel. We should always consider the uh, sweeping of our pro properly to distinguish the right jet. And uh, we should see that mitral and tricuspid jets are longer than the aortic stonotic, stonosis jet, especially in the mitral jet. The gradient is much more higher than the aortic stenosis because of the pressure gradient between left atrial and left ventricle. There is a table on the right side, the difference between the jets in aortic stenosis and the regurgitation. As I have uh, explained to you, the, uh, in the apical view, mitral has longer jet and mitral might uh, have more gradient than the aortic stenosis gradient. So um, these are the most problematic areas of our measurements. We, we might use thinking about multimodality imaging. For example, during elbow to measurements, artery root measurements, and ascending out measurements, transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiography might not be enough. Whenever there is a doubt in our mind, we should always think about a further evaluation. Sometimes 2D is not enough. It is not proper. And we might need another, another uh, imaging modality and it, is, it might be 3D or T or stress echocardiography, CT or cardiac MRI. For example, in planimetric measurements, planimetry is hard to obtain while we are doing 2D echocardiography, especially while we are doing transthoracic echocardiography. So 3D is always uh, have better resolution and superior to 2D measurements in planimetric measures. So we should always keep in mind our planimetric planimetric measurements in uh, T, 
together with 3D evaluations. Coexistence of sub or sprouting structures might be seen better in 3D evaluation. And also 3D evaluation gives us better uh, excluding of shadowings and reverberations in our echocardiographic images. Another point is the 3D measurement is especially really important before TAVI patients. For proper diagnosis, for proper valve selection, better procedural outcome, and predicting possible complications while doing TAVI procedures, 3D measurements are giving us really important clues and giving us a really handful information. As in the right side, we have seen uh, the LVOT measurements of a patient's before TAVI. And as you can see on the right side again, the LVOT is not circular, it is elliptical that might uh, affect our measurements in 2D echocardiography while giving us, giving the uh, evaluation of LVOT. So physiologic consequences might appear during aortic stenosis and in patients with aortic stenosis. And this physiologic consequences mostly affecting myocardium. Chronic pressure overload causing left ventricular hypertrophy, diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction together with pulmonary arterial pressure increasing and also with the atrial dilation. And our imagings are important to evaluate myocardium before our diagnosis or for our treatment to our patients. Myocardial assessment is really important. And one of the most important point is echocardiographic strain analysis. Because strain analysis are giving information about systolic functions. If there is ejection fraction depression, the strain analysis might also give us some, some information about the surgical outcome and might change our indication for surgery or timing of the surgery. But uh, because ejection fraction and 2D measurements are not enough, we should always keep in, keep in mind the strain analysis before our evaluation. Also, then there's, another, there's another thing that multivalvular diseases or change of afterload, preload, high output, low output flow or pressures myocardial function might be directly affected with these modalities. So we should always think about myocardial function analysis in multimodality imaging. If there is any ejection fraction, uh, if there is an adopted ejection fraction, we should also decide uh, how to use strain and how to use 3D ejection fractions in our imaging and in our diagnosis. Strain analysis is also important that Global long strain was found decreased in patients with asymptomatic aortic stenosis. Right now, when the patient is asymptomatic, we look for other modalities or other, evaluate, or other measurements. But strain is giving us really important information about uh, when to consider or how to consider or what to do as a treatment in our patients. Even though ejection fraction is normal age, the GLS, global long term strain, is decreased. And we might think about our intervention to these patients earlier than we think. To assess the myocardial function, we should always perform strain analysis to our patients in our tick valve stenosis patients. If there is decreased global long term strain, uh, we should look for the percent or, or the degree of global long strain and predict the intervention earlier than we think. For example, in a meta-analysis, more than 10, 100, more, more than 8,000 patients, they were asymptomatic and they were diagnosed with the severe aortic stenosis and their ejection fraction was normal. So they have found that when the global long strain is less than 14.7, it was associated with mortality and mortality with 60% sensitivity and 70% specificity. So this giving us the information that if the global lung strain is less than 4.7, these patients are having uh, worse outcomes when compared to the patients with better GLS. In another study that patients with preserved global lung strain, they have better survival when compared to the patients who have impaired global longest strain, strain with normal ejection fraction and independent of the severity of aortic stenosis. Another modality that we are using is a stress echocardiography. Stress echocardiography is important in three conditions. One is to accurate assessment of true or pseudo aortic stenosis. 
we might have normal ejection fraction, but the stroke volume is decreased. And we might find that our valve are less than one centimeter square. In these patients, the gradient might be less than 40. So we perform stress echocardiography. If the aortic valve area remains the same, but the gradient increases, we think that this is true and severe aortic stenosis. But the gradient does not increase and the aortic valve area increases. This gives us a episode of severe aortic stenosis. And this is totally changing our approach to this patient. Another is the, uh, another using point of stress echocardiography is the surgical outcome of these patients. Contractor reserve is really important before the procedure. We know that contractor reserve is, uh, there's, if there is no contractor reserve, the surgical outcome is worse. And we perform stress echocardiography for contractor reserve. If the uh, stroke volume increases more than 20%, these patients have contractor reserve, we believe, and in, uh, the outcome of the surgery is better in these patients. Another third point for stress echocardiography is for asymptomatic patients. Asymptomatic aortic stenosis, severe aortic stenosis, these patients should, all, should also be evaluated to stress echocardiography as well. But another uh, evaluation for these patients is the cardiac MRI. In the near future, with the EVOLVE study, uh, probably the results will be announced in, I think, 2024. Um, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it has been evaluated the, cardi the role of cardiac MRI in these patients. But we know of that. In a study, if the ejection fraction is normal and the patients are asymptomatic severe heart stenosis, if we have decreased global longer strain, we should consider MRI. If there is any presence of late gadolinium enhancement, abnormal T1 findings, or elevated extracellular volume in cardiac MRI, this is giving us that this uh, myocardium is affected really much and these patients should be uh, intervened earlier than we believe. If there is no myocardial abnormality, we might follow these patients three to six months. But if there is myocardial abnormality, we should consider earlier intervention in these patients. In summary, echocardiography is the milestone of diagnosis of aortic stenosis, but it's not enough. Multimodality imaging is important. Transthoracic echocardiography, transesophageal echocardiography, stress echocardiography with the new modalities, diagnosis, treatment, prognosis, decision making, they all best have been done with all modalities together. Combination of all findings is important. The one finding from one imaging modality is not enough. Always combine, always support each fighting with other modality and always consider additional imaging modality if there is any doubt in our mind. Thank you for your attention.